Good, good. Someone can hear me. Thank you for responding. Okay. I've written a question on the board behind me. Would you like to come and study English with Margarita Noyes? Um, Alessandro told me what to write. We are thinking about an idea to have Brazilian students come and practice their English and have some English lessons with me in my home. We want to take a poll and ask you if you would be interested in coming for one month or two months or three months, anywhere from one to three months, one to three months in our home. We live, um, my children and I live very close to Olavo and his family. So, and we live in a large house with some extra bedrooms. So we are currently fitting them up to receive um, all sorts of people. And if you would like to come for a period of time to visit with Olavo and his family, to be part of his seminar and also uh, watch him do his radio show and to live in my house and interact with all of the Americans who hang out there and practice your English and study. We would like to hear from you. We are thinking and making plans right now to maybe start having people come. So there will be a poll on the website soon with questions. We will try to um, tell you more about it and put out some idea of what the costs would be. And we want to know from you what you would like so that we can structure the program around your needs. So check the website over the next few days and hopefully there will be a poll and you can answer the questions if you would be interested. I'd love to meet you and I hope you can come. Okay, let us go ahead and get back into the book. Last week we were on page 34 and we had just finished the quote uh, toward the bottom of the page and we were speaking about community and I'm going to erase the uh, question We were speaking about the word community. And you will remember that there's this Cartesian dualistic philosophy that says a word has one explicit meaning, a meaning from the dictionary, a meaning that has to do with clear, logical, um, empirical content. And that is on the mathematical logician's 
end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a human ability to make connections, to say this is like this, but it is not exactly the same. It is a third thing. Um, we make judgments and we invest meaning into a word based on context. This is something which is um, personally apprehended, subjectively apprehended, and subjectively applied, but it is not arbitrary. There is a universal collaboration which invests concepts with meaning. So, we were speaking of the word community in a sense which could only be defined by context. And context, even the context itself, does not explicitly define the word, but rather the context invites the hearer to make connections and invest the word with a new meaning. And that process is the process that Levis is talking about. So he was talking about the word, he was talking about the new meaning, and he was talking about the process of using language flexibly, flexible. flexibly. This is the adverb. Using language in a flexible manner so that a word can convey meaning more than just the one meaning that the dictionary would prescribe. Okay, let us begin reading at the first full paragraph, beginning with the words, I use community, I say, in a special sense. So we will read, and then we will begin to um, examine more closely, beginning with the last paragraph, where we left off last week. Okay, so I'll begin to read now. I use community, I say, in a special sense in order to make my point. I make such a point, wait, sorry, excuse me. To make such a point, one has to use keywords in a special, in special senses, which one must rely on the context to define. The thinking that involves that use of community is a kind excluded by the criteria implicit in Andreski's logic and clarity. The thinking equals the process of using language flexibly. And this kind of thinking is excluded by Andreski's logic, sorry, and clarity. Andreski really appreciates a kind of common sense logic. That fits in very well with um, uh, Bertrand Russell. 
But the kind of thinking that is totally excluded by this is what we are trying to foster, according to Levis, through the mastery of language. So, the thinking that involves that use of community is a kind excluded by the criteria implicit in Andreski's logic and clarity, an exclusion compelled by the Cartesian dualism which those criteria impose. It is all in keeping that he should lightly and briefly dismiss Michael Pogliani. Marjorie Green, in that sentence, exemplifies the necessary and responsible and creative imprecision in the use of words of which I speak when she writes, have legislated into existence. She has already, in the same paragraph, thrown out intimations that, taken up in legislated, the word, which applies aptly enough to the laws of the discipline, make it acceptable as covering also the prior development which made both recognition of the laws and self-subordination to them possible. Quote, Mother and child, as Butenjik says, already form a society. The child's discovery and construction of the world already takes place with and through others, through question and answer, through social play, through the older child's or the adult's interpretation of pictures, the teaching of language and writing, all the way to the research student's training in the school of a master. All the way we are shaping ourselves on the model of, or in criticism of, others, and of the standards embodied in the lives of others. All knowledge, even the most abstract, exists only within the fundamental evaluation, first of the total community, which permits and respects such knowledge, and second, within this totality, of the special community whose consensus makes possible the existence of this special discipline. Now we'll begin with the new material that we didn't do last week. My argument makes it necessary to add an insistent explicitness here. The child's discovery and construction of the world is possible because the reality he was born into was already the human world. The world created and renewed in day-by-day -day human collaboration through the ages. The collectivity to which, when he uses the word social, Andreski reduces society may, of course, be said to have a depth in time in that it has a history which a social scientific writer might write. But for such a writer's thought, time is not a dimension in a community's actual present existence in the way in which it is a dimension an essential constituent presence in Marjorie Greene's community. I refer to the last quoted passage where the context gives a complex force to the word, a force that can be done justice to only in a decidedly anti-Cartesian community. I'm sorry, commentary. Let's begin at the beginning of that paragraph. My argument makes it necessary to add an insistent explicitness here. Okay, uh, first the word argument. Um, his argument means his thesis, his whole point. Makes it necessary to add an insistent explicitness. Why does he need the word insistent? Because the point has already been made. It's been made once and twice and many times. He keeps adding force to his initial thesis. So insistent means I will not let it go. OK, 
Okay, an insistent explicitness. He wants to be very clear about something which is not easy to explain, a concept which he is practically originating. These philosophical worldview concepts of the way we understand, the way we apprehend knowledge, the way we communicate it within our mind, making connections, making judgments and evaluations, and then the way we put it back out for the community to interact with. All of these concepts he is developing, and he is developing a vocabulary for. And he wants to be explicit. He doesn't want to be vague. Okay, so what is his point? He goes on to quote, The child's discovery and construction of the world is possible because the reality he was born into was already the human world. Okay, remember last week we spoke of children's um, discovery and construction of a world. They discover the world by experiencing what's actually there, what can be received by the senses, the actual physical input they discover. That relates to things outside of their mind with independent existence. But they also construct a world. They construct a system in their mind which corresponds to the world they see and experience outwardly. They construct a mirror that corresponds one-to-one -one with everything they learn about the world on every level. They construct a multi-layered, complex model of the world within their mind. So they discover the world and then they construct their model in their mind. Not unlike a representational painter, someone who has their canvas and they study a model. And each thing they see, they represent on the canvas. And in the end, when they turn and show you the picture, it looks exactly like what they are seeing. This is what the child does in their mind. They construct a system that mirrors what they've experienced. The child's discovery and construction of the world is possible because the reality he was born into was already the human world. Okay, you know already means it was in place before he entered. He entered into something that was in place. Um, the reality he was born into. Now, obviously, a child is born into the planet Earth. The material reality is not something which is in question. That's not what Levis refers to as the reality. The reality he was born into is more of the ordered system as humanity has already um, set it up so that it can be understood. So some people say, my reality is not the same as your reality. I find that to be somewhat, somewhat interesting and somewhat true. I had a friend visit me this week. She left yesterday. And she is a very close and dear friend of mine. And we went to college together 30 years ago. And one day, I started speaking to her about politics. And I remembered that in college, she was liberal, a liberal de Democrat. 
and she was in favor of abortion rights, which I was very against. And so I asked her some questions about modern day politics. And she gave me back, we spoke for a couple of hours. I just would ask questions and listen to what she had to say. She likes Obama. She thinks he should be re-elected. She thinks Hillary Clinton is a great person, wonderful heart. She thinks the Democratic Party speaks for the poor. She thinks the Republicans are disastrous for the United States. She thinks Obama's health care plan is on the right track. She has many ideas that, first off, I disagree with. But secondly, I don't know anybody else who thinks this way. Everybody in my world seems to be a conservative. And when she started to speak, I intentionally withheld any comment because I wanted to see the world through her eyes. And her reality is very different from mine. And I thought to myself, I wonder who is right or whether either is right. Maybe human nature is exactly the same on both sides of the aisle. We say in America, both sides of the aisle. I'll, say, I'll write that for you. Both sides This word is pronounced aisle, um, and it refers to the area of walkway between the chairs in the Capitol, where we have Congress. And on one side of the aisle is the Republican Party, and on the other side of the aisle is the Democratic Party, and there is an aisle in between. And so when you say both sides of the aisle, you mean the Democratic side, the Republican side, liberal Democrat, I mean liberal conservative. And so I've often wondered why people would vote for the horrible, crazy, disastrous laws that get passed. And listening to my friend talk, I realized that her heart is the same as mine, but all the people she knows have somehow have believed the exact opposite of what I believe about our politics. So when we use the term, the reality he was born into, we're talking about a mental grid through which he understands the world. It's an order that is imposed upon the world by society. So if you bring a um, savage from some country where they don't have civilization and bring him into a civilized tea party, he won't know what to do even though he may be very polite and well-mannered in his society. His reality is different from that of a cultured English person who goes to tea parties. So, the child's discovery and construction of the world is possible because the reality he was born into was already the human world. So the world has been interpreted for us by our forebears. No one is born into a clean slate. No one in that sense is original and taking the world as he finds it. 
we all receive the heritage intellectually of the community into which we are born. It would not be possible for a child to construct any sort of a coherent, civilized way of life if he did not come into a um, society which has already been structured into norms for him. Okay, so the reality he was born into was already the human world. And if you notice, if you're reading this, human world is capitalized. The reason it is capitalized is because he is emphasizing the fact that this is a proper name. This is not the generic biological human world in the animal sense. It is the civilization of humanity. It is the understanding of the world that humanity um, has constructed over the years. So human world is like the world, the word reality in this sen sentence. Both reality and human world do not have their literal meanings. They have these extra meanings that are defined by context. The human world is the, that which is of the heart and of the mind. Comma, the world created and renewed in day by day human collaboration through the ages. Day by day emphasizes that this process is continual. It happens all the time. It didn't happen in the 17th century, and now we're living with it. It happens every day. The world is shaping and being shaped. The world is taking form. Just like we grow, children grow a little bit day by day, the human world grows and changes and develops day by day. That's the emphasis of that phrase. Backing up, the world created and renewed day by day. In what sense is the world being created day by day? Obviously, the world was created millennia, ages ago, if you believe it was created at all. Certainly, its origin is millions and billions of years ago, whatever. So in what sense is it being created day by day? He is speaking of the world in the sense of the collective human understanding of what is. The collective human understanding of truth and reality. That collective understanding is being created day by day. And it is being renewed day by day. Sometimes the um, process happens rapidly. For example, in the um, Cultural Revolution in China, they went from an ancient civilization that was growing and developing very, very slowly to a total change in a very short period of time values, ideas, philosophies, all changed and stood on their heads and jumbled up in a generation. In that sense, their world was created in a very short time. Usually the process is very slow. We had a period of very rapid change of our world in the United States in the 1960s, almost to the point of a cultural revolution, where established understandings of what is good and valuable um, and appropriate and proper and desirable all 
stood on their heads and collapsed and cultural norms dissolved and new ones came about very rapidly. That is the kind of creation of a world that he is talking about. The world I live in today is very different from the world my mother grew up in because it was recreated very rapidly in the 1960s and has been recreated little by little and renewed day by day. So my understandings are sort of combed and ordered and categorized and colored and um, sifted by these events of history. Okay, so the reality the child is born into was already the human world, the world created and renewed in day-by-day -day human collaboration through the ages. And this word collaboration means that cooperation that we unconsciously contribute to, each of us, as we use language and express ideas in our day-to-day -day contacts with other people. The collectivity to which, when he uses the word social, Andreski reduces society, may of course be said to have a depth in time in that it has a history which a social scientific writer might write. But for such a writer's thought, time is not a dimension in community's actual present existence in the way in which it is a dimension, an essential constituent presence in Marjorie Greene's community. I'm going to stop there. The sentence goes on till the end of the paragraph, but we've already taken so much. I need to, I need to analyze this sentence. There's a lot happening in this sentence, many ideas. Let's pick them out one by one. Sometimes Andreski's sentences remind me of a train. You know, a train. It's got a, you know, engine and then lots of cars. And each car might contain something different. Maybe one has people and one has packages and one has coal uh, minerals. Each car has something different. As I read Andreski's sentence, the ideas go by and I want to catch them and I think I'll just finish the sentence and then the next idea goes by and I think, oh, I got to catch that one and then the next idea goes by. And I got to catch that one. And if you don't keep track of the grammar, it's very hard to, you can actually catch the ideas as they go by. But actually they go by in order, like a train. But uh, to really understand the entire force of the argument, you have to have the connections, the grammar. So let's, First, pick out the contents of some of the cars. In other words, let's get some of the ideas. We'll just pick them out and we'll separate them into separate sentences. Okay, let's see. The collectivity to which Andreski reduces society. Okay, let's start with that. Let me see how he says it. The collectivity to which, comma, and 
And then there's this, we're leaving something out. We're going to leave something out there. Uh, Andreski reduces society. Okay, anytime you have this to which, um, I think for Americans that presents a bit of a problem because you have to keep in mind what, you, you have to start drawing arrows in your mind of what it's talking about because what it's done is it has inverted the order. Usually we have the subject first, then the verb, then the object. But when they say to which, generally the object has come first and the subject and verb are coming later. So this idea, this sentiment, it is not a full sentence. It is not a complete thought. But this idea um, could be rewritten as Andreski reduces society to a collectivity. A collectivity is a word he is choosing to use. Really, the word in question is not collectivity, it's community. But Levis does not want to use the word community because Andreski does not understand the full depth of meaning that Levis has already put into that word community. So he is... Um, reducing the concept of community to a mere collectivity. A community, as we now understand it, is a mystical group, not a group that has the names written on a list, just a mystical group without material existence, but that actually is out there in some sense of people that cooperate to bring about a cohesive um, understanding of the world. Now, that, de that definition is way more than just a group of people. Collectivity just means a collection of warm bodies, okay? so. Actually, Levis is trivializing Andreski's understanding of the word community. That's why he uses quotation marks, which I forgot to close up, because he wants you to know that there's something linguistic happening here, that he is, if he were speaking, he would use a tone a voice to indicate a bit of contempt or he doesn't think highly of Andreski's understanding of community. He is reducing, he even says explicitly, he is reducing society to a collectivity. Okay, so keeping that idea in mind, let's uh, read it a little bit more. The collectivity to which, when he uses the word social, Andreski reduces society. Okay, so Andreski doesn't use the word community or collectivity. He uses the word social. But when he speaks of society, he is not thinking of a community. He is thinking of a collection of human beings whose names could be written on a list, who happened to be there. Okay? When Andreski uses the word social, he is talking about a group that is much less 
than community. Okay, I'm going to erase that much so far. That's the contents of one of the cars on the train. One idea. Okay. The collectivity to which, when he uses the word social, Andreski reduces society, may, of course, be said to have a depth in time, in that it has a history, which a social scientific writer might write. Okay. So this collectivity may be said to have a depth in time. Now he could just say this collectivity has a depth in time because it does. It literally does. Obviously any collectivity uh, maybe he's talking about the Association of American Sociologists founded in 1958 by 10 prominent sociologists and here's their names written on a plaque. That's history. Okay, that's the kind of history that Andreski's collectivity has. If Levis had said the kind of collectivity to which, when he uses the word social, Andreski reduces society, may uh, has a depth in time. That would be a true statement. But when he says the collectivity to which, blah, blah, Andreski reduces society, may, of course, be said to have a depth in time. The phrase be said to means you could say it has history, but not the kind of history we are talking about. So you may say it, but it isn't existentially true, not in the way I mean it. So when he adds the phrase, it may be said to have. He is negating the uh, what follows. He is indicating that he doesn't believe it really has this thing. Okay, so may be, and he says, of course it may be said to have depth in time. So of course, on the surface, literally, it has history. On the Cartesian end of things, it has history. History, which a social scientific writer might write, and again he uses those quotation marks. Again he's saying, I am calling it a social scientific writer, but these people do not have depth and dignity that I would give if they had more, more brains and more depth in their thinking. So it's, again, the quotation mark is a way of trivializing. It's a way of making it seem that it is not legitimate. Okay. Of course, may be said to have a depth in time in that it has a history. So in that means in the sense that it has a history, which a social scientific writer might write. But for such a writer's thought, time is not a dimension. So they're saying this allegedly social scientific writer who thinks he's a real expert, his thought, in his thought, time is not a dimension in a community's actual present existence. Time is not a dimension. Okay, once again, Levis is using words that context must define. And by that I mean 
He puts the words out there and invites you, the student, you, the reader, to bring things from your own experience and add meaning to the words, to make connections with something you already know. In what sense is time not a dimension in a community's actual present existence in the way in which it is a dimension. So what he's saying is, for the social scientist, time is not a dimension for his collectivity the way time is a dimension for Marjorie Green's community. So what we have here is two worlds, two realities. You have the Cartesian dualistic reality that Andreski is comfortable with, that Bertrand Russell puts forth, and that the scientists are comfortable with, that which excludes anything which is subjective or apprehended invisibly or supernatural or spiritual or purely emotional, um, something that can't be weighed and measured, okay? So you have the material worldview on this end, and over here you have the world where we believe in things that cannot be seen, per se. And both sides use the same words. We use the word community. We use the word time. We use the word dimension. We use present existence. We use all these words, social, scientific. We use all these words, but they mean something different on either side of the whiteboard. So for the collectivity that Andreski is talking about, it has a history. It was founded in 1975. A writer could write that history and it would be perfectly fine. But when we talk about the fact that a baby cannot apprehend and construct a worldview, except that he be born into a community which has already constructed that worldview, these people would say the community doesn't exist, the worldview doesn't exist, nothing exists of what we're talking about. These people would exclude the very existence of everything these people are talking about. So when he says Andreski's collectivity does not have the history, time is not a dimension in the same way. That's what he means. Of course, actually, we would say time is a dimension, even in a community of social scientists. But they would not say so. It's not part of their worldview. Okay, so, bottom of page 34. Time is not a dimension in a community's actual present existence in the way in which it is a dimension, an essential constituent presence in Marjorie Greene's community. When you think about Marjorie Greene's community, when you think about the world a baby is born into, when you think about human experience, you should be thinking about something which extends back to Adam and Eve, to cavemen, to the beginning of recorded history, and through all of the civilizations that have risen and fallen, all of the hard times and good times, all of the advancement, technology, philosophy, um, medicine, all of that is encompassed in your word, human community, your concept, that percept, that has a place in your in your mind, it should have depth of time. And it is not just what a 
history writer could write in terms of numbers of people and dates of battle, names of generals, names of countries, borders of countries. It's not just that. It's something more and something deeper. And this is the kind of thinking we want you able to be able, we want you to be able to participate in. And the foundation of it is mastery of a complex and subtle language. English or Portuguese and the literary language thereof. Okay, so continuing with the same sentence. Uh, let's see. Uh, time is an actual, essential, constituent presence. Constituent means it's a necessary ingredient, very important. Constituent uh, defining and ruling um, ingredient. Constituent presence in Marjorie Greene's community. I refer to the last quoted passage where the context gives a complex force to the word, a force that can be done justice to only in a decidedly anti-Cartesian commentary. Complex force to a word. Force usually means this kind of force, but in this case it means a, um, a linguistic force, uh, a depth of meaning adds to the force of the word. Context gives the complex force to the word. That means you give the complex force to the word by drawing your associations from your life's experience. Okay, when you read it, it presents a springboard and you have to take it from there. And that's where the force of the word is. If you just read over the word lightly and you don't think and you don't bring in your experience, the word will not have force. And when these people read the word community, they just read it real fast and they don't give the depth and they miss the complex force. The force comes from you, from your ability to read deeply and to think deeply as you read. And it can be done justice to. Now, what does it mean to do justice to something? I'll give you another context. Supposing I'm going to a feast. Supposing I'm going to a, um, uh, a restaurant where they bring out lots of wonderful food, maybe five courses. You begin with a little something, then you have a salad, then you have a soup, then you have the main course, then you have dessert, and afterwards you end with a little drink. It takes three hours to enjoy this meal, and each course is uh, prepared by expert world-class chef. Supposing I go to that meal, and I just came from McDonald's, and I ate two Big Macs and a large fry and a chocolate shake, and I'm stuffed. I will not be able to do justice to the meal that the chef is providing. I do justice to it by coming hungry and by taking time and by fully appreciating every facet. So, the force of the word can be done justice to only in a decidedly anti-Cartesian sense. The force of the word can be, um, you can make a meal of it only if you receive the words flexibly and bring much uh, evaluation, which is creative to you to the word. And once you've done all that create, creative thought, then you regurgit back, regurgitate it back out into the community through what you write. So you write to me your thoughts. Maybe send me a poem or send me your thoughts 
And then I think about your thoughts and bring in my life experience and allow context to give force to your words. And then I put them back out there. And you all springboard. And our world is created on a day-by-day basis. It's renewed and it grows and we grow with it. So that's the process. Okay. So this can only happen if we are the kind of people who are thinking deeply and who believe in that which is invisible, even thought itself. Yet, next paragraph. Yet, I think that Andreski offered those sentences to consider might very well pass the total community as inoffensive to his habit of disciplined common sense, his criteria of logic and clarity, pass it as being for thought, no more than the logically and clearly analyzable collectivity. In the part played by this concept in his thought, we may see the extent to which the Cartesian ghost can disable a notably vigorous intelligence. Beginning with the word yet, you get the idea it's sort of like the word but. Something a little bit different is coming. Yet, I think, okay, I see what's coming. All right. What we were talking about before is we made this huge distinction. We said way over here you've got these people who think of everything as uh, its logical, explicit dictionary definition, and they don't go any deeper than that. And so Andreski's society really could be referred to as a collectivity. which just means a collection of people that you could write down their names, the actual material collection of specific human beings, individual people. Whereas over here we're using the word community to mean something so radically different, something which goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, something which is mystical and invisible and you could never write it down and it has no actual physical existence in any database. It has no letterhead and no president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary. In other words, it, in a sense, does not exist. Yet, it has all this meaning huge, pregnant with meaning. And we're making this huge divide between them. Yet, Andreski, if offered those sentences to consider, which have all these words in it, might very well pass the total community as inoffensive to his habit of disciplined common sense, his criteria of logic and clarity, pass it as being for thought, no more than the logically and clearly analyzable collectivity. So what he's saying is Andreski, reading these words, within the totality of the community, Marjorie Green, he wouldn't even notice. He wouldn't even notice that this has so much more meaning than what he was meaning by his social um, group. He would probably not notice that there was um, a different usage of language going on. For thought, it says here. He would pass it as being for thought, 
no more than the logically and clearly analyzable collectivity. So, you know, when we read, we do think about the words a little bit as they pass by. You get some thought going there. And then when you hit the total community, you get this much thought. See, what we wanted was when you hit community, you get, you know, that much thought. And you meditate on it for a while. But for thought for him, it's like, okay, dictionary definition of community means a group of people. Just like that, okay, keep going. So for thought, it doesn't trigger anything. And in his way of thinking, why should it? Because nothing else exists. Just the empiric meaning exists. So he's not really looking for something behind the words the way human beings do when they are more, more alert. Okay? So, yet I think that Andreski offered those sentences to consider might very well pass the total community as inoffensive to his habit of disciplined common sense, his criteria of logic and clarity, pass it as being for thought, no more than the logically and clearly analyzable collectivity. In the part played by this concept, in his thought, we may see the extent to which the Cartesian ghost can disable a notably vigorous intelligence. In the part played, um, if you go to see a play, you might have a character who plays a part. Well, in this case, this concept of a collectivity is playing a part in Andreski's mind. Collectivity means a group of names of people who are involved, specific individuals. And when he reads the sentence and he gets to the word collectivity, that concept is attached and it plays a part in his thinking. And he's not able to get the point that Levis or Marjorie Green is trying to make because when the word comes, it doesn't have um, the generic existence which would enable you to invest meaning. Rather, it has a specific brand of definition that really can't change. And so his thought is disabled. He's not free to come across a word and pull meanings in from his own experience and to meditate, ruminate, and come up with something new because that is not part of his process. And his intellect is disabled because a human being is supposed to be reflective. All human beings throughout time have had the ability to reflect. But in this new age, when that which is important is only scientific knowledge, that which is real is only that which the scientists tell you is real, the atoms that make up this, or the molecules, or the cells, or the elements, but not what I see with my own eyes. They would say a person is just a group of chemicals that happens to be together with the illusion of consciousness and life. Whereas I meet an eternal soul, a human being. They certainly seem human to me. And when someone dies, it doesn't seem like they go out of existence. It seems like they pass over. But they're Scientists would say, nope, they're gone. So people are supposed to be reflective. But if you have been taught that there is no meaning other than the meaning the science scientists tell you and that words have one explicit meaning and that you can't, you can think about things, but there's no real communication on these other levels kind of disables your thought. And Andreski 
has a vigorous intellect, should be strong and fruitful. But this Cartesian ghost has disabled his ability to see what's happening all around him. To the business of exorcism, the distinctive discipline of thought that should characterize English may be said to be addressed. But that is only a negative account. Its force depends on a realization of what, positively, the kind of thinking which the discipline fosters is. To the implicitly invited challenge, there can, of course, be no answer that is direct and brief. I will move towards providing one by recapitulating the account I have given in various places of the nature of practical criticism, or rather, of what I refuse to call that, but exemplify later in this book under judgment and analysis. I think this will be the last paragraph we do. So let's, let's uh, analyze this last paragraph, and then it'll shoot us into a new um, concept next week. Okay, to the business of exorcism, to the business of exorcism, the distinctive discipline of thought that should characterize English may be said to be addressed. Okay, this is another one of those inverted sentences. Remember I said before when it says to which, you've got an inverted grammar and Americans have trouble keeping track of it. That's the same thing going on here. I think Levis probably goes with the thought that's in his head first and then fixes up the grammar later. Uh, he wants to emphasize the concept. That's the only way I can understand his writing style. Um, so let's uh, simplify this sentence. Okay, in the previous paragraph, the last idea was Cartesian ghost. So we have a ghost. A ghost is a spirit, like an invisible spirit, um, like a demon. Demons have to be exorcised. I think that was the connection in his mind. And that's why he went from the end of that uh, paragraph right into to the exorcism, because ghost and exorcism are so closely linked. And then he says, well, it should be addressed, coming around from the back. But what he's really saying is, What he's really saying is the distinctive discipline of thought that should characterize English may be addressed to the business of exercising this Cartesian ghost. So the Cartesian ghost and the uh, exorcism should go at the end of the sentence. The distinctive discipline of thought. Now, the dis distinctive discipline of thought we've been talking about is the use of language to make connections. Those connections being essentially experiential. You learn by experiencing the world. It's very personal. Also, by reading about the experiences of other people. So it's all these experiences of the world, experiences of the world, which can contribute to making our understanding what it is. And when we think, we take one thing and say, that is like this, but not exactly like this. It is a bit different. So we bring things together, we judge, we evaluate, and we come up with new truth. And that is how truth 
originates in our minds. New ideas come about. And um, so this type of thought, this ability to make connections, come up with new truth based on experience, is the essential distinctive discipline of thought. And it characterizes English, English, the study of English, study of literature, analysis of literature, all that should be addressed to the exorcism of the Cartesian ghost. Now, addressed to, if my son, if I tell my son to go clean his room and he comes out and tells me something like, my sister is bothering me. I will say, address yourself to your task. Address yourself to your business. That means give your attention and your activity toward the solving of your problem. So when you address something, you engage it and you work with it and you conquer and finish and solve the problem. So the distinctive discipline that should characterize English, the ability to study literature and to learn from experiences of many other people throughout history, as well as through your own experiences, and to become deep and wise through this means. That's the distinctive discipline of English that should be sufficient to exorcise this Cartesian ghost which makes you unable to think. Okay, so to the business of exorcism, the distinctive discipline of thought that should characterize English may be said to be addressed. May be said to be addressed. In other words, we say that we're going to Fix this problem by teaching people how to study English and to develop their ability to think. But that is only a negative account. Its force depends on a realization of what positively the kind of thinking which the discipline fosters is. So exorcism is negative. We say, okay, we're going to get him to stop thinking in a dualistic way. We're going to get him to stop thinking in the Cartesian dualism. But that's only negative. You get him to stop doing it, okay, maybe he won't think at all. No, it has to be replaced by um, with something. We're going to get him to stop thinking that way by getting him to think this way. We must positively define what we will replace it with. It's not good enough just to say these people's thinking is inadequate. We have to explain what it should be, what we'll put in its place, what we will put in its place. So it was only a negative account to say get rid of it. Um, getting rid of it, the force of that depends on a realization of what positively the kind of thinking which the discipline fosters is. Okay, so we're going to have to start making that explicit. To the implicitly invited challenge, there can, of course, be no answer that is direct and brief. This was said at the very beginning, and it's being reiterated now. Okay, to the implicitly invited challenge. Okay, the challenge is to make explicit, make clear what kind of thinking we would like people to do after we have gotten rid of their Cartesian dualistic thinking. Okay, so the challenge is to define it. 
and to that challenge there can be no answer which is direct and brief do you remember when we were talking very early in the book about the role of teachers who are designing a curriculum and Levis said it should be creative it should be developing uh, but he wasn't able to be explicit about you know how many hours a day and which books to use and which methods to use he wasn't able to craft a specific curriculum like that one size fits all because that would make it impossible to be creative about it that would make it impossible to be responsive to the individual needs of the individual student in front of you and that was the number one one of the very important uh, criteria for the uh, curriculum well in the same way apparently the kind of thought that he is trying to foster can't be clearly briefly explicitly defined I will move toward providing one uh, I guess that would be an answer to the challenge the challenge to uh, make the thinking explicit he'll answer that he'll move toward providing an answer I will move toward providing an answer by recapitulating the account I have given in various places of the nature of practical criticism or rather of what I refuse to call that but exemplify later in this book under judgment and analysis so he is giving us notice that he is going to speak again about the kind of thought he is trying to foster um, by speaking again about practical criticism no no he doesn't want to use the word practical criticism he will instead exemplify what he used to call practical criticism by giving us an example of judgment and analysis using uh, the poems of T.S. Eliot as his literature later in the book so um, beginning next week I suppose that's where he's going and uh, I think we should probably stop now and if you have any thoughts comments questions anything you'd like to say send it in now and if we have questions we'll come back I'll come back in five minutes or so uh, to close the class and if we have questions we'll discuss them then hello I'm back um, I just looked at an email from a student and last week he sent me a question about President Obama and I gave my opinion his question was um, are Americans concerned about President Obama's birth certificate and my answer was that most Americans are not concerned the reason they are not concerned is because number one they don't understand the Constitution America is unique or unusual in that our Constitution protects our rights and most Americans don't understand how that works they take their freedom for granted and the fact that Obama is not a constitutional candidate for the president is really quite terrible but people don't understand it they don't understand the implications our Constitution says that a candidate for the presidency must be a natural born American citizen the reason for that was so that people like Obama who have connections to our enemies 
would never be able to be president. But most Americans think that this requirement is not important. So they don't understand. And most Americans think that if anyone takes the question of the birth certificate seriously, he's crazy and he's a lunatic on the fringe of society. People who take it seriously are scorned and made fun of. So that was my answer to that question. And then just now I read another email from the same student and he suggested that we take one hot issue in American news or politics and have a 10 or 15 minute discussion of it in class. He suggested one issue which I would not want to speak about unless I did a little bit of research. So I can't speak of it now. But maybe next week I'll speak of that. And if there is any question you would like me to discuss on the show here, please email it to me so that I can prepare. So I'm very interested in um, speaking about issues that you are interested in. So send me some ideas and we'll see what happens. And next week, I'll try to uh, say something about the political issue which the student asked about. So see you next week. And don't forget to check the website for the poll about whether you would be interested in coming to the United States to study English uh, with me.